In the world of chess, an immortal game is basically the best aggressive attacking game that a person has ever played. A lot of you have enjoyed uh, some of my videos that I've been uploading, like the best game I ever played. Earlier today, uh, I played this Blitz game against this guy Chesslock, uh, anonymous grandmaster, maybe Japan, uh, maybe not. Uh, he's got the Sherlock Holmes profile picture uh, from the show, and I had the white pieces. So let me just go through it. E4, C5, and I played A3. Uh, this is one of the sideline variations that I like a lot in, uh, in the Sicilian. It's in my openings course. Uh, he goes D5, and so uh, this move hits the center right away, and I bring his queen out very quickly. Now it's kind of like a Scandinavian, except both of us have played two extra moves. So, you know, something like this, uh, except for some reason I played A3, and then for some reason he played C5. But I like this, and so I played knight f3, knight, knight f6, I keep developing, obviously all my pieces come out. He has to go e6, uh, because if he plays bishop g4, there is this very nice trick, bishop takes f7 check, which is sometimes possible uh, when your knight can now move out of this pin, check, and hit the bishop. And I should note that if his knight was on c6, this would not be possible, because he would just take my knight and defend everything. But it's a unique position where this kind of tactical possibility can exist. Anyway, he plays e6, I castle, I move my pawn out into the center, move my bishop, h3, put my rook in the center, and now really is where is where the game begins. And a lot of you ask me, like, how, how do I play the middle game? Which is a, it's a tough question to ask, it's a very uh, broad question. Uh, normally, you know, your middle game flows out of the kind of opening that you play. And, well, I, uh, I played this kind of an opening, and so we have a position where I can't really look for any breaks with my pawns. Uh, this is covered, this is covered, oh, sorry, that's covered. So you start to basically look at, is there any way to put some pressure, create some sort of attack? And so I played the move knight g5, because let's say my opponent here had played something like h6, um, I was going to sacrifice. Uh, I was just going to go all in here, take on f7, uh, and if he took with the rook, I would have taken with the bishop, and then I would have had this pin, so I get two pawns, maybe I'm going to get uh, the rook and get the king a little bit open, but I'm going to wait. You know, for example, if he defends, I'm not going to take right away, maybe I continue to improve my position a little bit, uh, maybe I play knight b5, try to go over here, because this pin is not going anywhere, but in the game, after knight g5, uh, he played the move knight d5, which blocks my bishop, and now the other thing that you have to ask yourself is what is he opening up, right? So the bishop and the queen now hit the knight. But this knight is now no longer protecting this, uh, and so here I play the move queen h5. All right, queen h5 obviously threatens mate. Now here, uh, he could have, instead of playing the move h6 as he did in the game, he could have just went back with his knight, and then I would have had to figure out what to do. I mean, do I repeat? You know, do, do I come back here? But he played the move h6, and now we see the position from the thumbnail. This is where the immortal begins. Oftentimes, immortal games have a lot of sacrifices. So here, I noticed that I can play the move knight takes e6. Uh, and I can pick up uh, two pawns for the knight. Now, what else has changed? So, so when all these trades happen, this rook is now open to a free bishop. But more importantly, this knight is really destabilized. I have three things hitting that knight. He has no move in this position where this knight can get sufficient defense. Now, if this knight takes this bishop for a moment, he is up four points of material, and he is forking me, and it looks like a devastating loss of material, but we have this, more than anything else, visualizing that me winning those two pawns in black's position actually weakened his king a lot, and any rook move is discovered check to the king. I can also play this, for example, and I can go for the queen, but I have to be careful. My queen is also hanging, so there are certain tactics in the position that serve to my benefit. My opponent thought for a while here and played the move knight d4. This move uh, hits my rook and adds a defender to this. Now at this point, if I play something like bishop takes knight, I'm getting rid of my most important bishop. So then if I take with a knight, for example, he just comes back and takes my rook and I run out of you know, any sort of attack. So at this point, a move came to me pretty naturally. You know, my, my, my rook is hanging, my bishop is hanging, what do I do? Try to pause here uh, and find the move that basically is the solution of the entire game. It is, you know, it is the, uh, the, the basically the most beautiful move of the entire game. It's the only move that wins. I'll give you a few seconds to pause. 
That move is the stunning move rook takes h6. So first things first, what is the whole point of this move? Well, if my opponent doesn't take me, this is checkmate. Okay, that's just mate because the queen is covering the escape square and the rook. Now, if he does take me, uh, I don't just take this, I give a check. Very important, I force the king to the corner and then I take the pawn with another check. And now we have this position from which I can give a few zigzags, check, check, and win this knight. I can also play something like this. If he takes with the bishop, I have check, king moves, and queen h5. The king now has to come back there, and now my bishop and my queen link up and do damage on the king together. I had seen this if he had taken my rook. In the game, though, he played the move knight e2 check, which is actually a fascinating move. I can take with the queen and the knight, but during the game, I thought I should play here. And it turns out that I was right. And I, and I should have played this move because my knight needs to stay looking at this. So for example, if he does this, he's still getting mated. If he takes my rook, I still have the exact same sequence of checks and, I, and, I, and I'm winning. But I couldn't resist. I was like, this just, it's free. Let me take it. And it actually wasn't the best move. But, you know, that's the beauty of an immortal game. He takes my rook. And now I just come back, give him a check, take his pawn, and play knight to g3. He still can't take this because this is pinned. And since it's pinned, this is actually protected. Now the move knight g3, I want to do some damage. So he plays rook f6. Got to keep my queen alive. Only move is to give him a check. King f8. And now we bring in the knight. Now there are two threats. Number one is to take, but number two is to bring in the queen protected by the horsey. If he moves this knight here, I also have mate because of my all-star bishop on c4. So he goes b5. And here, I guess he wanted me to take, removing the bishop from this diagonal, but it's kind of funny. Taking is plus 14, according to the eval. But I found, uh, you know, basically for a, a forced win, forced checkmate. So you can pause here, try to visualize how you would get this all the way down to the end. Queen g7 check, king to e8, and now bishop to b5. The difference is that when you take, this is now check. He goes here, the only thing protecting the bishop is the rook, so we take with check. He takes, I take, his king has no legal moves, he can block with the queen, or he can block with the knight, he blocks with the knight, and now we have checkmate in two moves, queen g6 check, and bishop h6. A very, very convincing victory, so convincing that at this point my 2700 rated opponent did not even accept a rematch. He had had enough of one game uh, at the time and he didn't even want to play again. Another cool checkmate I have here is the very quiet Rook e1. I could have played a very aesthetic checkmate, giving my last piece a shot in the game, and now my opponent cannot prevent queen g8. He does not have a single move that stops him. Can't move this, can't move this because of the pins, and queen g8 is unstoppable. Yes, you can move here, but then I would have two extra checkmates, and I would be winning. Rook e1 would have been a very aesthetic way to end the game, but I saw the way of brute force here, here, and here. Now, if, you'd, if you're an e4 player, uh, and you don't yet have the openings course, link is in the description. Uh, but if you do not want to get it, and you just want something inspirational to play against the Sicilian, give the A3, B4 variation a shot. Uh, I cover it in my How to Crush with E4 video, a little sneak peek of it. And in general, you can do a little bit of openings research in the database. But figured I would share this game with you guys. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, and if you have any more ideas of certain short videos like this that you'd like me to share, let me know in the comments below. I'll see you in the next video.